I'm outside Pierce Hall at Harvard University and I'm about to meet Professor Federico Capasso together with the CEO of MetaLens, Rob Devlin. The field of metal lenses this day cannot be hotter because companies from the consumer electronics sector are considering this technology to be the next generation optics in mobile phones. But today we want to understand what happened and what's going to happen next from two of the geniuses of the field. Let's go to meet Professor Federico Capasso and Rob Devlin. We always start from the physics. I have the deep belief that physics is the fountain of youth of technology. But you have to have an attitude to be right in between. And I always felt myself, I have one foot in technology and one in science. And I try always to impart this to my group. Because sometimes in, in the academics, including U.S., not as much as Europe, there is science. And then there are the engineers that implement the science. And that's wrong. Sometimes it goes this way. Sometimes you do a technology development and that allows you to create new physics. <laughs> Federico Capasso, yeah. were you expecting the huge attention that meta lenses are bringing to the market? No, it was, uh, I would say, as often ha happens for exciting things, it's difficult to predict the, uh, what actually is going to be the outcome. You know, we started with basic research on so-called meta surfaces, you know, that are uh, arrays of sub-wavelength uh, spaced optical elements. Sort of for the fun of it, we had some interesting type of ideas. We wrote a, f a first uh, paper on s in science which uh, was uh, showed that if you design in a certain way metasurfaces, you can generalize the laws of refraction, Snell law, and uh, reflection. Then out of that, we realized that we could make what can be called a metal lens. It was made, however, of metallic elements on semiconductors, so the efficiency was very poor, even though we showed that the spot could be sub-wavelength space. Then, you know, things stayed dormant, I would say, for three or four years, until we had uh, uh, Rob came in, coming up with a way to fabricate uh, these structures using dielectrics rather than metals, okay? Dielectrics are not lossy like metals. So he had a first paper on uh, doing very interesting holograms using this new process that he um, uh, pioneered. After that came the big science paper, the second one, where uh, he was a co-author, I was a co-author, and others where we demonstrated a metal lens made of dielectric material in the visible, which had uh, high focusing efficiency and performed, in a sense, as well as a microscope ob uh, ob objective. And that would really, then it caught fire the field, you know. I remember that uh, Zeiss was interested. In fact, they came over because they wanted to see the stuff for themselves, and there was a joint paper written with Zeiss uh, studying the uh, aberration. And in the same year, we decided to actually start MetaLens. So 2016, we had the science paper, right? And then we started the MetaLens uh, the same year. Rob, but again, it was unpredictable, you know. Rob, you work with Federico Capasso. You realized that he could actually make flat optics, but with the functionality of microscope lenses. Yeah. Do you see a business behind this? I think um, when we initially started out, a lot of it was just to improve the process, improve the design, um, make these meta surfaces more practical. I think it wasn't until we actually published the science paper and it was on the cover of science when we started really getting essentially cold calls from some of the biggest companies in the world. I mean, Federico's phone or um, the Office of Technology Development here at Harvard were getting cold calls from some of the, the largest cell phone manufacturers in the world saying, when can I get this? And that was, I think, when um, you know most of us that were working on this were focused on academic careers, honestly. And it was a chance where you saw the external excitement and we said, well, it's probably time to see if this can actually make it out of the lab. So I think the 
the business, the development of the actual business, where it might go, the product market fit, all of those other things really came from an external stimulus that then made us say, okay, well, I think it's probably time this, this technology really has legs to it and let's see how we can actually turn it from something that has produced you know, lots of beautiful academic papers into something that can really be in people's hands and how can we, what's the right market? Federico, it's about bringing the right technology at the right time. And Rob just said, everything aligned. And the right people. Correct. I was going to go there. People are the most important thing. You know, resources are important, ideas are important, but people is the main asset. You know, I spent 27 years at Bell Labs. My last incarnation, I was head of physical research, and I realized that absolutely we had the resources, but we didn't have extraordinary type of resources or money. It was a fantastic environment of very brilliant people and very focused. That was, that's what I learned, and this is what I've tried in my group also, to always focus, you know, on natural people, right? Not per se, money is not the most important thing. Of course, it's essential, right? When it comes to bringing a company out of Harvard. How is, is it difficult? Does Harvard support in terms of IP management or IP sharing? It was originally. When I came to Harvard, you know, the Office of Technology Development was not very efficient. Then a new head came, you know, and he really turned it around. And I would say, I can only say, right, Rob, great things about the Office of Technology Development. In a sense, they are proactive. They don't wait. Every time, look, we file patents, we continue to file patents in different areas. The OTD immediately asks me, often they send me an email or they call me, Federico, remember a report of invention if you want to file a patent. And then within a short time, we start the patent process and then they ask, you know, is there some company that is interested now, uh, you know, that uh, Metalens has a, a license to have an IP in the in the whole area of actually flat flat optics. So then they they decide whether to license it or not. You know, sometimes they say yes, sometimes they're not interested. You know, right? So that's the process. I would say it works very well. Let's go now to the most important part of this interview. A few years ago, the two of you shocked the world saying that meta lenses could be manufactured with deep UV lithography. And then you proved your point by taking a semiconductor fab and doing it for you. Yeah. Well, doing it with a meta lens material that seemed very likely to be yours. Uh, Federico, is deep UV lithography enough to manufacture meta lenses? I think so far, you know, there is a work on extreme UV li lithography, but to the best of my knowledge, and you can ask Rob, I don't think there is, there is an immediate sort of need or even short term, right, to uh, move into that kind of uh, lithography, right, Rob? Uh, Rob, many people are actually using nanoimprint lithography, they're trying to convert nanoimprint and deep UV. Is that not necessary? Yeah, at the end of the day, uh, especially with the applications where we've launched metasurfaces into the market now, Federico mentioned at the front that metasurfaces are these sub-wavelength optical elements, right? And so you think sub-wavelength may mean you're making really, really small nanostructures, but compared to what the semiconductor industry has been doing for years and years and years on transistors and electronics, these are all really large features. Even when you get into the visible wavelength range, if you're making visible metasurfaces even, the features tend to be very large. So, you know, I think these other technologies are, are interesting, maybe if you're looking at really large scale type of patterning or something like that. But it's very, very difficult to compete with 60 plus years of innovation in the semiconductor industry that's making features that are already you know, an order of magnitude smaller than we need to make any of the meta surfaces. So that that infrastructure that's there, that's actually one of the things that Federico had had pushed from his group was that it wasn't something that was just the demonstration of a flat optic. It was how do we make something that's a flat optic that can actually fit into a manufacturing process that already exists. And that's why Metal Lens has been able to scale as quickly as it has. It's because the meta surface, the technology, unlike many other photonics and optics and technology in general that, that are out there from academia, they've required a new process, a new fabrication. The infrastructure wasn't there. 
And that put a huge bar, a huge barrier for them to really enter into the market. Whereas meta surfaces could fit into the existing fabs. And you know, as far as we can see right now, those deep UV fabs that we're working with and partnered with, um, they have our roadmap covered for you know the next 10 years. What is really game changing is the fact that now the same foundry that do the CMOS chips can also make the meta surfaces because they use fundamentally the same semiconductor technology. That was not an anticipated. I think when people started to see our paper where we made a lens, a simple lens, which was made of glass, mm -hmm. okay, by deep UV lithography, bingo, the lights uh, turned on in, in the minds that people saw it. You see what I mean? So people saw that. You were not the one telling the people you can use your well, machines. Well, we said it in this paper. In fact, I had a paper that was entitled, uh, uh, it was a metal lens done not with deep UV, but with eye-line lithography, but still it was semiconductor lithography, where the title was, you know, Metasurfaces and m for m Mass Manufacturing. We made it very clear in the actual title. What is, Rob, what was the most difficult thing of bringing the technology knowledge that you developed together at university to an industrial environment? I think one of the, the biggest challenges in, you know, a lot of startups end up facing this is uh, sort of the classic chicken and the egg problem, which is the concept of the meta surface was really clear when you were going out to industry and people could see it immediately on the slides of how impactful this technology could be. Uh, similarly, you know, the companies that we were engaging were looking for something new because there hadn't been a huge amount of innovation, especially at, at the optics, the lens level, right? There hadn't been a huge amount of innovation there for quite some time. Um, but then ultimately those companies want to know that it's mass producible. You know, when you're, when you're doing a PhD, when you're publishing an academic paper, you need, you know, a few devices to get your figure for the paper. When you're talking to people in industry, they say, okay, well, show me 10 million of these that all work within a specific set of parameters. And when you're first going out, you don't even, even though meta surfaces were able to be manufactured in these fabs, there's a big investment for companies to make in order to bring up a process. And you as a startup, you don't have the money to pay for development process at a fab from the beginning. So it was finding the right partners and customers where we could bridge that gap, where we could demonstrate proof of concept of the mass producibility of these meta surfaces. Then the companies started to say, okay, well, I now see the proof points, I'm, I'm willing to invest more. And then ultimately finding partners who were able to help us take those slides of all of the promise and then put it onto an actual manufacturing line. Uh, so that, that really was the biggest thing. And again, the fact that the technology was set up that it could go into the fabs at least took one barrier down because we didn't have to go out and say, I need to develop an entirely new manufacturing mass production infrastructure. So, Yeah, also there was one thing, Harvard helped in that because uh, the prototyping of the meta lens was done initially not at the foundries, but done here at Harvard in the Center for Nanoscale System, which has many industrial users. So Harvard invested in this. When I came, it was just beginning, and there was really some, some good uh, strategic thinking that this could be helpful. And in fact, there are, I don't know how many users, probably hundreds of users, right? Yeah. CNS. So that was very helpful. So Harvard did support not only with Office of Technology Development, the licensing, but also in, a in enabling the prototyping by startup companies. And that was actually quite critical for us is that even when we didn't have the fabs up and running, we were still making prototypes. And even still now, when we're looking at, uh, say, a new design, we can still do very rapid turn prototypes here at Harvard before we put all of the overhead in bringing it up in a mask set at the foundry. So uh, that was a really critical thing was the thing that helped us bridge that gap in the chicken and the egg problem was that we could hand physical prototypes, at least, for them to measure in their lab. And all of the processes that they saw, even if it was made in a, a prototype facility, they could make the, the logical leap to say, okay, well, these are all dimensions and materials that are compatible with the CMOS fab. 
Federico, we are hearing lots of rumors about consumer electronics companies being very interested about meta lenses. What is your preferred future? How would you like this technology to, to evolve? Well, I think, uh, I think what I w would like to see, I mean, you know, there is a field that I'm following is uh, that of augmented reality. Some call it mixed reality and so forth. In fact, we initially, you know, uh, collaborated with uh, some of the companies. Uh, in fact, with uh, when uh, Google was working on the Google Glass, remember the yeah. Google Glass, right? They contacted me, in fact, and they funded me for it here. And then, you know, the uh, later also with Microsoft, in fact, the same uh, person that had sponsored me in Google, he's a very prominent uh, scientist in Trappen, I would say, Bernard Kress, yes. who worked for Microsoft and now is back at Google. They funded me for two years. There are some still fundamental problems that haven't been solved. For example, the waveguide, so that you can have, uh, you can see both the virtual world and, and good see-through. So I think that is in the making. All the big companies are working on it, Meta, but it's not quite there yet because there are some, I would say, fundamental technology problems that also need quite a bit of science insight. But I think that could be a could be a big uh, could be a big breakthrough. You know, I don't know what uh, you think, Rob. Yeah, I think um, there's definitely a lot of interesting things in augmented reality. I think one of the most exciting places we see is really how meta surfaces are able to bring new forms of sensing to consumer form factors, consumer price point for the first time. I also think just in general, um, obviously you can't ignore the AI boom that is out there right now. And I think one of the things that meta surfaces bring and what we're doing at MetaLens now is to bring an entirely new information set to these machine vision and AI systems for for consumer markets. Um, you know, it, it's something where you really can do something that is unique and something that um, brings new information to these AI systems. So rather than just building up the same large learning models or using the same old information, it's something new. And then you now have, uh, essentially, you're supercharging the AI with these new innovations that meta surfaces can enable. Federico Capasso, it's been an honor to meet you. Robert yes. and I are going to go now to see MetaLens, the company, and understand with more of the facilities and how the oh, company yeah. looks like. I would like to congratulate you on behalf of the Silicon Photonics community, the Quantum Cascade Laser community, the Optics community. Thank you for your amazing contribution to the optics and photonics Thank industry. Thank you very much, Federico and Rob. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go to MetaLens and meet your CTO. Yeah.